Women of Wyoming Then and Now is brought to you by the Wyoming Historical Society and supported in part by a grant from the Wyoming Cultural Trust Fund, a program of the Department of State Parks and Cultural Resources. This program features unique female perspectives on events, themes, or narratives related to state history. We, the host, believe that one woman's action toward a better future can result in a greater legacy that inspires and equips many generations of women to come. Welcome everyone to Women of Wyoming Then and Now. I'm today's host, Janelle Maloney, an author and historian, and I'm super excited to have a special guest here with us today from Wyoming's history. But first, let me introduce my co-host, Linda Fabian. Thank you for letting me join you. I'm Linda Fabian, Executive Director of the Wyoming Historical Society, a position I've held for many, many years, and it's an honor to be involved in this project. Agreed. We appreciate you being here today. So I have the honor today to introduce to you our special guest, Rebecca Keyes. She's one of Verna Keyes' granddaughters. And if you don't know who Verna is, she's credited with designing Wyoming state flag way back in 1916, but that's not where the story should land. Let's go to Rebecca right now to hear what she has discovered and why she's the best person to tell this story. Hi, Rebecca. Hi, Janelle. Hi, Linda. Thank you for including me in this project. Um, I am Rebecca Keyes. I'm a granddaughter of Verna Keyes Keyes. And, um, and a fourth generation descendant of her early Buffalo parents, Billy and Estella Keys. I have to throw that in. I'm an artist, writer, Alexander Technique teacher, and um, also now a researcher, archivist, and historian telling the untold story of Verna and the Wyoming state flag. Um, Verna helped to raise me. I thought I knew Verna really well. I grew up with all sorts of things around me, artifacts, um, and in particular, her origin story, a narrative that uh, she carried forward, began speaking in the 1940s uh, in lectures around the state. And then, then that story got sort of uh, spun in different newspaper articles. And it's all true, but it's, it's, it's a mishmash of facts that are based in a narrative created by um, Grace Raymond Hebert and it leaves out the whole story. That's interesting. So I, I, we talked earlier, actually in a phone call for those who are watching, we talked earlier about how sometimes narratives are created before we get into our research. And those narratives are really important tools and resources. However, we have to give ourselves permission to write a new one especially as family historians, our credibility. And of course, you knew, Verna, this is not so many generations back that you didn't personally know her. So there's credibility that is really important that we add to those pre-existing narratives. Basically, again, I grew up with Verna. I was very close to her. Uh, we went to Wyoming a lot. Um, and I, but I hadn't been to Wyoming for a while. And in 2017, I came out for the uh, 100th anniversary of the ratification of the flag. And I was really surprised, Verna passed away in 1982. I was really surprised how missing she was in Wyoming's culture, how there were basically a few library and very nice displays, but they were small displays at a couple of museums and libraries about her. And then these articles that continued to tell her origin story. And I finally thought, wow, it's like she's been enshrined in this origin story. And Virginia Scharf, a historian, Virginia Scharf, um, talks in her book, 20,000 Roads, Women, Movement, and the West about people who become lost to history. So it was like Verna was hardly visible to history, as Scharf puts it, and, and basically become silent and disappear. And that is what happened because that, at that point, I just thought it's my duty to my grandmother and to Wyoming and Wyoming's women and girls to start looking into this because I, I was just really increasingly puzzled, again, because I thought I knew her well. I, I would like to ask a little bit going all the way back to the competition the contest for the flag design. How old was Verna at the time? Verna had just turned 
23. She, wait, she was, so she, her birthday is August 16th. She, she was born in 1893. So she had just turned 23. She had just gotten back to Buffalo. She had had this stellar career at the Art Institute working under a world-renowned designer. So she was 23. Grace Hebert was 55, who was the person who launched a flag design contest in 1916 through the Daughters of the American Revolution. And um, Grace Hebert conceived of the contest, um, launched it through the DAR, handled all the calls for entries, entered her own design, and was one of the final judges. And after Verna won, Grace Hebert continued to shape her vision for a flag for Wyoming. She did not ever have, as far as my research has shown, any known official Wyoming state position for management design or administration of the flag. And Verna, Verna basically had to go along with what Grace Hebert was drew, doing in one of her letters at uh, the archive, she, Verna says, it's a, it's a May 23rd, 1949 letter to the uh, then state librarian, Ellen Crowley. Verna says, you know, few questioned or crossed Grace Hebert. Um, another thing too, how many other uh, not, um, contest entries were there? I'm going to say this, the numbers of the entries, there's, there's different newspaper articles. Grace Hebert handled all the PR and all the entries and all the advertisements in the papers for the article. And then at the end, she was the one who gave the facts that for the articles that got written. So one entry, one article says that, um, I can't remember which paper it is, but it, it says there were 26. Okay. And then that number got changed through the years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so by the end, they would say there were 37 entries. Can you tell us something very specific about your research? that you think will actually impact the future generations of Wyoming historians? So since then, I've um, continued pretty intensive research, especially on the early, early flags, the great seals, the bison, but everything else in between as well. Grace Hebert was instrumental in getting W.W. W. Daly of Rollins, a senator, to promote her flag bill. Grace Hebert wrote the flag bill and wrote the statute. And a lot of people don't know that she left out any specifications of Verna's design, anything mandating Verna's original design, any anything mandating which version of the Great Seal would be used, and the, the, um, the direction of the bison on the flag. So Verna, basically Verna's design was written out of the um, flag specifications. And Verna didn't know this, I'm pretty sure from letters in the American Heritage Center that Verna didn't know this. It appears that Grace Hebert sent her a copy of the state flag statutes in May of 1917. And Grace Hebert also made a design change herself to the flag statutes, turning the great seal uh, from blue and black, which was what Verna's rendering was, to blue. It's a very interesting, very nuanced facet of this narrative of history of what led to the flag that flies over Wyoming today. And it was then something um, that was this over, you know, that, that Verna had to deal with that um, because Grace Hebert was a very, very powerful person in Wyoming for 45 years. I find this fascinating as an author, or I'm also a news journalist in my um, in the Phoenix area. And so when I submit my articles, even to submit a manuscript for a publication, I do know that my most, uh, my best evidence of work is going to be touched some might say meddled, uh, meddled with by the senior editor. Well, of course, because it's their baby, it's their publication. And I wonder if some of this is a little bit like that. So if Grace Raymond Hebert puts on the contest and organizes the contest and chooses the winner, well, I know she has help doing that. Um, is it very similar of a process in that little gap from the original pure design to the final design. Is it like that editing process where 
we just say, hey, it's her baby. Uh, Verna prevailed with this through extraordinarily challenging times, and she buried the years 1916 to 1936. And, it, and to, into the 40s and managed to prevail. She's a model of resiliency, courage, creativity. Um, she's, she, you know, she's the fourth generation descendant of these intrepid suffragists and other people, eight people in all who came across the plains between 1828 and 1891. So that's in her bones. And, and the fact that she charted a course, created her own way to very diplomatically work with, with the overarching indelible influence of Grace Hebert while surviving. She ended up having to live nine years at home. She thought she was going to marry her beau, who was disabled with mustard gas in World War I. So she comes off of this extremely successful career at the Art Institute, already a designer, already winning awards. She comes back to Buffalo. She, you know, she's glad to be there. She launches a business, but like many college graduates, she goes home. Oh, she's living with her parents, she, but she thinks she's going to get married. And then World War I breaks out. And all during this time, she meets Grace Hebert and, and kind of whatever Verna might have thought might happen with her flag changed dramatically and quickly. Almost better to just let it go right now than to try and get into it right now. I'm, thank you, Janelle. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that I, I'm sure a lot of our um, viewers can relate to that. Sometimes when we're misunderstood, it might not be the right moment to go toe to toe with that. And sometimes family historians uh, actually discover information, but we wait, we wait on it. We don't want to expose or create negative perceptions or invite speculation and criticism into the family. So we wait a few generations till a few people pass along and then we'll get into it. So timing makes sense, especially considering the um, fam family situation that she found herself in. Going back to the uh, topic of the design, um, one, one of my pet peeves is that the original design was reversed. Um, the original design was with the buffalo facing outward, free, running. Yeah. And, and Grace Raymond Hebert, I think, took it upon herself to turn it around so that the buffalo was facing the post. Yes, by not specifying the direction, she left the door open to do really whatever she wanted. This is my theory that Verna, that Verna's original entry was not what the senators saw. It sounds like this gap between her original design and the final printed flag might be what inspired you or necessitated you to pursue correcting the narrative. Does that sound right? There's just been this story that that is so that's not factual. But also, it is, it, is, it is really Grace Hebert's narrative. So you can't look at the flag without looking at Grace Hebert's role in it. And a lot of it is shrouded in, in silence, uh, in things we don't, we have never seen, things that didn't get talked about, and then things that kind of got, I'll just say, factually skewed. Well, this reminds me of an American economist, Thomas Sowell. And he said something that mirrors what I think you're feeling here is that some things and I'm reading it. I don't want to mess this up. Some things are believed because they are demonstrably true, but many other things are believed simply because they have been asserted repeatedly and repetition has been accepted as a substitute for evidence. But Rebecca, you actually have some evidence which can't be denied. Oh dear. Well, I have some evidence. Um, there's the place where there's the most evidence is the American Heritage Center and then in family papers and oral histories. And yes, like this. So some of my research, oh, it's not straight. There's her, there's her signature. Okay. Verna mm -hmm. <laughs> produced, um, Verna produced a first iteration of 
a new a new version within a within a few months of her winning the contest she got, did a couple of things she um found a flag manufacturer she was probably mentored by louis millet he helped her get a, a very good flag manufacturer in chicago there's a january 5th 1917 letter in the in her papers in the archives you know basically saying we're going to give you this exclusive contract which turned out to be a very good thing for her um but she had this this is her you can barely see it oh dear no um, it's good this is a blow up from a low pretty low res photo of of her what i call um her pretty quick sketch for the flag contest and it's it, really it, good for a pretty quick sketch that's really great <laughs> It's really good for a pretty quick sketch in a 1.8 inch diameter circle wow. at the last minute with like, what, what do you guys think? Little tiny pens? Little uh -huh. tiny pens? Okay. Mm -hmm. However, Verna and Grace Heberg were both perfectionists and Grace was really in a hurry to get the flag ratified. Okay. So she did a lot in those three months. Verna produced this postcard. It was subsequently used this is a much more refined and articulated design, mm -hmm. you know, and and it got shrunk down really small to a postcard. And essentially, it I think this is what was shown because there's been so much mystery about, well, what did those what did those guys in the Senate in the legislature see? What did they vote on? Right. And I think what happened, because, again, Verna was a perfectionist and Grace Hebert at that point didn't have another drawing, but I don't think they wanted to show uh, Verna's sketch. Pretty sure this is the great, more reminiscent of Edmund Stewardson's original Great Seal, 1893 Great Seal, as well as um, uh, the, the Great Seal that Grace Hebert entered in the contest. I'm pretty sure it's similar to that. This image appeared in the 1917, this is Verna's issue of the 1917 issue of National Geographic, which I should have the page marked and I don't, I'm sorry. Um, I didn't know I was going to get to do this. So here it is. There it is. There it is. I have a left right problem, guys. Sorry. So there it is. Um, that um, it appeared in the frontispiece of the first volume of History of Wyoming which came out in 1918. It appeared in um, these postcards that she began issuing. And then basically the same postcard image was used by Grace Hebert. Grace Hebert flipped the bison and then added her own great seal. And this great seal that is, again, on this guy is, is, is I think, the precursor for the great seal that was on Grace Hebert's postcards. A factoid, my study shows that You'll know it's Verna's great seal if you see them ever because it has a sans serif font. You can mm -hmm. barely see it. I'm so sorry. It's a sans serif font. It's very simple, almost primitive um, printing. So with all of this work, with all of these discoveries that you've made, which really are groundbreaking, even though they've always existed, um, the getting them out there is groundbreaking. What do you hope will happen next? How do you hope that this research will be interpreted or used um, in the future? Well, first of all, I um, really hope that it will increase awareness of, of the, the rich history of the flag, but also Verna's contributions. This isn't like a vendetta at all. It's just Verna deserves to have people know what really happened, but Wyomingites really deserve to know. To know that the flag that flies over their state is actually the creation of Grace Raymond Hebert. But in the long run, do you have an aspiration for things to change, for the design to go back to its original self? Um, what what do you hope happens? Stepping way back, Linda, my first aspiration is that this narrative gets corrected and that all the, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to go back and fix every article that's been incorrect, but that the narrative that, that doesn't tell the whole story gets corrected. But it's also like 
something Janelle and I touched on in our call, which is silence. You, you have to look at what doesn't get talked about. You have to look at things that, that there's like no evidence of. And Verna called, she went through her records. What she gave to the American Heritage Center um, was very carefully curated. And there's a lot missing. There's like five letters from the George Lauder company, the manufacturer. There's a lot of letters from Grace Hebert, um, but it's, so I don't know if I answer, I mean, it's, it's hoping that, that again, the first thing is just to have more of Verna's story. So Verna can appear because she was an inspiring person who started the Casper Fine Arts Club. Uh, you know, she did a lot of things for the arts and education in Wyoming and on a civic level, she's a civic hero. I would love to see her by the bison turned around uh, on the flag. I think all of these years, to be quite honest, much of it was harrowing for Verna and her family. I think it was humiliating. I think it was very disappointing to have her win this contest and not see her flag fly over Wyoming. Um, and they again contained themselves and just kept moving forward you know, valiantly. And then she went on, I mean, she did the Girl Scouts for like eight years. She became a national director. Um, she was one of the first advocates of wildflower, Wyoming's wildflowers. So she did these wildflower walks um, with and introduced hundreds of girls um, throughout Wyoming and in, I believe, Montana and South Dakota to the Girl Scouts. It sounds like Rebecca not only was that um, artistic skill passed down, which is evidenced by your curriculum vitae, um, but also the passion has been passed down, the passion to express and to advocate. And I love the idea of reversing the buffalo because of the symbolism and the meaning. It's very important. And I would have chosen to see the buffalo be presented as free. Uh, Rebecca, thank you so much for bringing Verna back to life. So many children and adults know about a little about Verna. They know that she designed the flag, but they don't know the real story. So the value that you are adding to Verna Key's life is invaluable. And I, for one, hope that we will be able to learn more. And maybe before I disappear, Get the flag turned around so the buffalo is free. Who ever heard of a buffalo flying into a post? To be honest, as a designer, so I went to art school. I went to a small art school similar to the Art Institute, um, actually in the same association of colleges. I know we're going to run out of time. And I've done a lot of designing, and I will just say the bison is the easiest thing to switch on the flag and the Great Seal. So Grace, in my opinion, Grace Hebert picked it was very clever to leave out those specification specifications. And then those were the things that she changed. Oh man. Thank I you. am so excited to be able to share this story with future generations and also current researchers who get to hear from someone who knows best. And it I just, just well, as you speak, you are finishing your grandma's sentences right now. And I'm completely honored that you were here with us today. So that's all the time that we have for in today's interview, unfortunately. But we are happy to promote Rebecca Keys. She is writing a book and detailing all of this out. So well, as soon as that book is out, we'll include all of the information with this video for everyone to take a look at. Thank you again for joining us, Rebecca Keys, and also for Linda for your wonderful um, contributions to the conversation. We are honored that you all joined us today. Hey, for more videos from Women of Wyoming then and now, please check out the links below. Thank you, everyone, and goodbye. Thank, Thank you. you.